Hey guys, welcome to the Ace of Place channel and to, unfortunately, some of you might say, uh, another video talking about artifacts and how you can fix artifacts and artifact removal. Uh, but I wanted to make this video because, you know, obviously after or since scenarios were released in December, the whole artifacts versus artifact removal discussion has definitely become extremely relevant again. And at this point, like as as a person who is very passionate about Gwent, really loves Gwent, and also thinks like just the concept of artifacts could be really really cool, you know, it just pains me to see that the state of artifacts is still the way that it is, and that honestly scenarios kind of made it worse. But uh, you're probably sick and tired of seeing Reddit posts and YouTube videos about this stuff. So I'm going to make it quick. I don't have a lot of custom reworks to show you, just like five, four or five. And uh, we're just going to go through them real quick. I'm going to try to make this video as short as possible. Uh, basically what I've done, like for this idea, as you can see on the screen right away, armor. Giving artifacts armor. Uh, that's a big part, but not the entirety of the concept that uh, I will be presenting today. But what I've done is I've taken artifacts and separated them into categories. As you can see, this now has the equipment tag. Uh, we have scenarios, which recently got their scenario tag. And I also have structures. Now, I don't know if these three will be enough to cover all, uh, all the different types of artifacts we have, like uh, Ale of the Ancestors. Like by the official definition of the word structure, you could maybe put it in there, but it doesn't, it's not really a structure. It doesn't feel like a structure. And it's not really equipment. So, you know, maybe we need more categories. Maybe we need a, a, a bit of a rework on what cards are artifacts and which aren't. Uh, but that's not for me to discuss today. I have made these three categories. Equipment, uh, scenario, which I didn't make, but it's part of this. And structure. They're all artifacts. Although scenarios arguably shouldn't be artifacts, but I'm not going to delve into that discussion now. They're all artifacts, but their tags uh, separate them in more than just word words. Because depending on their tag, they function differently. So, first of all, equipment. Mastercrafted Spear. Uh, zeal. Order, damage an enemy unit by 2 and lose 2 armor. Cooldown 1. It has seven armor and it costs six provisions. Now the idea of course is that artifacts can be targeted with any form of damage. Alzer's Thunder can deal five damage to this. Uh, a Demon Pirate Captain with Bloodthirst 2 can deal three damage to this. Because you, you can attack a spear. You can try to break a spear. You can shoot lightning bolts at a spear to try and Try and break it if it's proving problematic to you. So the idea is all all types of damage can hit this. Uh, you know, we could have cards that deal extra damage to artifacts or to equipment. Uh, not a lot extra, not super binary, but just like, oh, you had this card, which is kind of cool. Here's a little bonus. Uh, of course, first of all, I, I, I did try originally, you know, to have this order be damage a unit by one and lose one armor but it didn't really feel that impactful like, like I wanted it to to feel like something you would consider spending an Alcer's Thunder on and I just didn't feel like it it was that when it just did one damage at a time so now it does two so it gets its value quicker more at a time more efficiently it's still capped at the same thing. I give it seven armor just so a, a one ping doesn't turn it off. Um, but this can effectively deal six damage across three turns. It has cooldown one. And you know, damaging something by two is a lot more impactful than one. It's a lot better for bloodthirst. Uh, it's a lot better for reach for your removal. You know, this combined with uh, a, a, 
the the <laughs> what the hell is it called? The the bomb that uh, banishes on death blow. You know this with that you can the death blow banish something at six. It was a lot more impactful. Uh, spending five damage on this will of course it has seven armor, so it will still get one charge. But you know they spend that on deploy anyway usually. So like you shut it down, and uh, it's kind of worth it to do it. Uh, and of course in some circumstances. You're not really as scared of this effect. Like you're not... Like maybe you're playing point slam and you don't care about extra reach on their removal. This is just a six point car. Doesn't do anything. So it gives more... A lot more in interactivity. Uh, you know, room for thought. Like is this worth my removal? Or am I expecting something worse? Like a unit or another artifact? And of course like the order... Uh, the losing armor part, that's just wear and tear. Like, that, this should be a staple for equipment artifacts, in my opinion. Like, they lose armor. Like, you use them, or they get attacked, and they get worn down. And we could have cards that repair them, you know, give them more armor, you know, give a unit some armor, give an artifact more armor, stuff like that. And... Uh... My general idea right now is that when this runs out of armor, it still stays on the board. Because, like, it's a broken spear, but you can repair it with, like, a blacksmith or something. <laughs> we'll get to that. And you can use it a little bit more. And, of course, you know, cards that care about artifacts. Like, I, I, I love cards like uh, Pyrotechnician, uh, Line of Credit in Syndicate that care about artifacts uh even great oak like great great oak is maybe too busted right now but i like the fact that it cares about artifacts even when they're spent like just if they're sitting on the board still that's a point for great oak i want a lot more interactions like that and so i therefore i don't want equipment to be destroyed when it's out of armor because you can repair it and uh Speaking of repairing it, ha ha ha, Uncreate Blacksmith. A card that is not seeing play, and it's not really surprising why. So, I, I use this for uh, my little my little project here. Deploy melee, give an allied unit 3 armor. Can be good value, it can be a, a 4 for 4, depends on what the opponent is doing. Or deploy ranged, given allied equipment, 5 armor. Now, I don't want you to think too much about numbers in this video. Uh, provision cost, power, uh, armor amounts. Because I haven't spent a lot of time trying to balance these. I just wanted to put my ideas down on digital paper, <laughs> I guess. And uh, show it to you. But yeah, he's a blacksmith, so he can give an allied unit some armor because he's literally making armor for them or he can fix an equipment repair one of your equipments so the flavor is there uh, it's a new form of interaction that we don't have in the game so it makes it a bit more interesting and uh, you know we can have we can have artifact based archetypes we can have equipment Skellige and because all the equipment will be interactable with armor they can be damaged they can be turned off uh, but they can also be fixed like it's it's a full-on interactive gameplay but it's a new type of deck equipment skeletons sounds great uh, they have blacksmiths they have an armor smith they have warriors that need weapons maybe not so much armor but uh <laughs> they have ships so that, that's just an idea for a, a flavorful card that could work with equipment uh, but uh, enough about that. I'm not going to talk too much about the blacksmith. It's it's just a, uh, an example of a card that could work with uh, my concept of equipment. Moving on. All right. So sacred flame. I bring this up in whenever I talk about artifacts. I bring this up because I think it's a really well designed artifact, especially by the standards we have now for artifacts. This is really good. But uh, this is an example of a structure. So its, it's ability is the same, you know, it spawns the zealots, and whenever you spawn a unit, boost it by one. Uh, this has armor. Uh, again, 
don't care too much about the numbers, but I did want to keep the armor relatively low because this does get a good bit of value on deploy. If you use your leader, you can, or, or the guy that, one of the many guys, or multiple guys that spawn zealots, uh, you can get very good value out of this immediately. So I don't think destroying it should be that hard for the opponent. If it's a long round, you're playing a spawn, spawn heavy deck, you know, the opponent can, can see this and think, this is probably worth my removal. And they have to make a decision. But it's it's probably at least not game-losingly bad if they decide to destroy this. Uh, the only thing I've added to the text is exposed destroy self. Because this, this is what I was thinking for, for structures, right? Like, equipment and structures both have armor. But I'm thinking equipment consumes the armor as wear and tear. Whereas structures, they don't, but if they lose their armor, they're completely destroyed. And I'm, you know, I'm thinking structures, like Svalbard Totem would also be a structure. Structures kind of bring something to the table right away. Uh, which is why they'll... I think it's okay that they, they, they're destroyed. And of course, they also have passive effects in this case. Which is something I really love on artifacts. Uh, would fit great for structures. Uh, but of course, I don't want to lock, lock that to, you know, uh, an armor value. So just, it has the passive, but if it loses all armor, it's gone. Uh, you know, I, I, I figured you could also have structures that instead of having exposed destroy self, you can just lock their passive to a barricade ability. And then you can repair it. Like, like, that is possible. But in this case, I figured if, if you come in here, you throw a bomb at this, or you blast it with magic, you destroy it. Maybe, maybe it is indestructible in the Witcher lore, but I'm, you know, I'm just thinking in terms of gameplay. Like, it gets destroyed. It's gone. It did its thing. You know, it's fine. So, yeah, that's my idea for structures. They're similar to equipment in that they have armor, but they don't consume the armor, and they generally also give you some points right away, and then instead have a passive. And in this case, when it loses the armor, it gets destroyed instead of sitting on the board, uh, potentially being able to be repaired. Moving on. <laughs> I, I hope this is making sense to you. I, I was, I'm actually really happy with... The, the concepts that I thought out here. Of course, it's not all my original ideas, but uh, like I, I did make these examples myself, and I, I did think of a lot of this myself, so I hope you like it. Moving on. All right, of course, of course I'm going to be talking about scenarios, but I'm going to save that for the end. Uh, right now, I just wanted to take a card, which the majority of people who, who replied to my Twitter poll think this card is okay currently. I don't. So I reworked it. You know, now it... You know, deploy melee, damage an enemy artifact by 5. Uh, it's 2 strength, 5 provisions, obviously. Uh, deploy ranged, damage 2 random enemy units by 2. So what I did... Again... Don't worry too much about the specific numbers. They can be changed. I'm not here to balance. I'm here to... Talk shit. I figure the ranged row ability, you know, he's in the back, he's throwing the bomb, right? And I wanted to make the ability similar to the Elven Bomber or Dol Dolblathana Bomber or whatever it's called. You know, one strength, damage two enemy units by two, four provisions. Uh, so this one is one more provision and one more power. It's neutral, so I made it random enemy units. Um. Uh, so that's the range throw. He just chucks the bomb. You know, he hits whatever. Uh, maybe not not head on, but like the blast takes him, which is why it's like two damage to him and two damage to him. Great. And on the melee row, you know, he's up there. So I figured he goes up there and plants a bomb, right? On an artifact. Like a structure, maybe? Hmm? And, and, you know, abilities like this, you could... 
you, you could separate between the categories like with the uncrate blacksmith you know it uh, could give five armor it was five right <laughs> it could give armor to equipment but not to a structure uh you, you could have it be able to give it to structures or you could have this only be able to damage structures although i think that's probably fine just damaging any artifact by five but but yeah that's the general idea is i do like cards with a different ability for each row like the modularity is something i think is really cool in gwent should be utilized more and i think this is a good way to do it because you you know do you even have to explain it artifacts binary nature trying to fix it uh again numbers don't matter too much <laughs> please don't care about the numbers okay now onto the scenario all right so for my scenario example i am going with siege and uh i haven't changed much now i want to say that i do think maybe uh having bombardment as chapter two might be too much uh maybe you could have it as chapter one so it's a bit more limited in how much damage you can deal after you play this uh or you can just not have it at all i posted a another custom version of this on the discord where chapter one was you played a siege support uh, which you could use to boost your reinforced trebuchet, you know, make it inspired. And then when you got the battering ram as chapter 2 on, on that version of the card, you could give it zeal with the siege support. So it was like really flavorful. Uh, toned down a little bit, like tuned down a little bit on power. But it was still a siege. But uh, yeah, the prologue, chapter 1, chapter 2, they are the same. Uh, the only thing I've changed is the progression. Uh, you may notice this doesn't have any armor. I figured scenarios should be like they like you, you can't have armor on a siege. You know you can't have armor on the event of the the action of faking your death <laughs> in front of a caravan, right? So they're less interactable in that sense. Um, but because of the new progression that I've implemented uh, that increases their interactivity uh, without having to you know, deal with artifact specific removal. So instead of progressing whenever you play a siege engine, it now progresses when you control three siege engines and then when you control six. So you play this, you get the trebuchet. Okay. Next turn, maybe you play another trebuchet and you use mobilization to pull out a third trebuchet you now have three siege engines so you get the chapter one you spawn a battering ram now you have four and then you play another one and then you play another one and you get bombardment a big bombardment big finish um, you could also play siege engines like maybe play five siege engines and then play this you get the trap. You now have six siege engines, so you progress through the entire thing at once. <laughs> uh, but your opponent can still interact. Like, they see you're playing siege engines, they know siege is coming. They can still kill off your siege engines, because they know that you, you, you're trying to plop this down safely. So, this is... Like... I'm not even... Am I even gonna say it? Yes. Don't care too much about the numbers, like the control three engines and six engines, siege engines. That can change. The provision costs can change. If this is too bad or still too good, the numbers can change. But now instead of the opponent having to deal with the scenario, like the artifact itself, they can just deal with your siege engines. Which are just units, normal units, they can be killed. Uh, you know, traps, battering ram. Uh, I mean, most of them have like four power. Four or five power, uh, if you count like vitality and formation. Uh, so they, they can be killed by, by removal. Maybe you'll never get to, to the bombardment because your opponent was controlling 
all your siege engines. So, like, I, I don't know, like, balance-wise, I don't know if, if this is now too bad, or if it's fine, but numbers can change. Uh, I just really felt like if you change the progression to be something like this, then it's a lot more interactive. And you can have the scenario itself be practically immune. Like, I think, like, stuff like a heat wave could still take this. Like, heat wave costs 10. That's fair. If heat wave takes this. And I think Yennefer's Invocation could still take this. Because now. They can't just play it themselves and trigger it really easily. Like, this is going to be hard for an Elfgar player to trigger. So those cards still seem fair and sh should, could still be able to take scenarios. But, uh, you know, no five provision artifact removal should be able to just straight up kill this. Uh, but if you have, you know, enough five provision removal cards... You know, all the bombs and Alice's Thunder. You can kill off a bunch of siege engines and still prevent the progression of the siege. Makes sense, doesn't it? And it's like with, with Feign Death, the Escoitel scenario. Um, you know, that, that could have like a progression when you control this and this many elves. Maybe, maybe. Like, they don't all have to be when you control this many units. But if it was that then, you know, like you play elves, right? And they're all feigning death, setting up the trap, making the 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 caravan trap more, more better, more stronger. But if the opponent kills those elves, like if those elves are no longer faking their death, they're actually dead. That, that, that hinders the progression of that ambush, right? It makes sense, it makes sense. And it's more interactable without having to make these 14 provision cards be destroyed by binary cheap effects. Okay. That's all I had for today. Uh, if you watched this entire thing, thank you so much. I appreciate you hearing me out. Um, let me know what you thought about my ideas, my concepts. If you have any of your own or anything to add to this, that'd be great. Um, I think if we learn one thing from, from Gwent Homecoming, like the re official release, you know, with the base set and all, it's that one or two, one or, like one or two people alone should not design a bunch of cards. You need a team, you need a group of people who can all weigh in and, you know, have different perspectives. So, don't let me just bust out these cards. Let me know what you think. And uh, like and subscribe. Thank you for watching the video. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, hope you're not too sick of content or read a post about this. I just, I, th I think artifacts could be such a cool concept. But, but like they just had to be brushed under the rug early on. They've been completely out of the picture. Just a bunch of dead cards in the collection. And then scenarios come around. Bring it all up. <laughs> Maybe worse than ever. And I, th I think there are ways to make these cards work in a really cool, flavorful way, adds a layer to the game, a layer of, of like interesting mechanics and stuff. So I really want artifacts to work. This is why I'm pushing this. I want them to fix artifacts and artifact removal. Because I think the game would be a lot more fun if artifacts were, were non-binary, playable, and fun. That'd be great. That'd be great. Have a good one, guys. I'm not gonna take up any more of your time. But uh, I'll see you hopefully tomorrow for uh, one final gameplay video before the weekend. So uh, have a nice Thursday. Or whatever day it is where you are. How do time zones even work? Bye, guys. <laughs> Bye. Drink water. I'm all out of water. I'm going to go refill this, edit this video. It's going to be great. I love you. <laughs> Just go before I say more dumb shit. <laughs>